Welcome to the, thir the third part of our tutorial uh, considering MVVM, uh, WPF, using MVVM Lite. Today we'll cover um, uh, one area of this, it's uh, about data validation. And um, the complete cast will circle around one interface, um, essentially it's called iData Error Info, which is a built-in interface. That's not all about uh, data validation. There are more interfaces which will be part of another tutorial uh, in the future. But today we will concentrate on iData or info. As you can see, um, like in the two past tutorials, I'm using the same solution. If you're interested in uh, this source code, it's hosted on GitHub and it'll be linked in the blog um, article which is written in German but you can see the links when you follow the link um, below this video. So I prepared a little bit. Um, first of all I just created a new form which I won't check in because all the stuff which I uh, talk about today it is already implemented in the main window and so you have uh, this data or info sample window will not be included in the source code but the complete things I'll, I'll show you today are included in the main window already. So I created a main window, just gave him a few properties, uh, a data or info info uh, window. Mm -hmm. Then I just changed my app XAML a little bit to, I changed the startup URI so that when I start the app, app XAML will be called and it will open the data or info sample window instead of the main window. Just test this out and just hit play. And now you can see that this window is called instead of main window. That was this. Then just close those ones. I just went to my logic UI, which you know when you see when you saw the other tutorials. And I'm worked on the main view model previously. And now I created a new one, a data error info view model, which is empty right now. It is inheriting from view model base. So that's it for the moment. And now I want to show you what you have to do when you introduce a new window and a new a new view, um, so-called, and a new view model. You have to change your view model locator a little bit. So first of all, it's a kind of copy and paste scenario. We will tell the simple IOC container, hey, simple IOC, there's another thing you should take care about. It is called simply data error info view model. So if you see this or somebody is interested in getting a data error view, info view model, you are the person or the thing uh, which should know what to do. And then we have to create a new property called, for instance, data error info of type data error info view model, which is returned by the service locator get instance which goes to this one in fact and gives us an instance of this so of the data error info view test view so okay now we are about to be prepared as always i just built my rebuild my ui layer and then i go to this new window and then just say your uh, if you want to see here just want to do a little bit more. Here, this data context property, you have to copy it from there and say, um, it's not the main property of this one, but the data error info property of the view model locator. So right now, we just wired up everything. It's a little bit of left hand, right hand side uh, doing, cause you have to do all the same stuff all the time. But basically, that's how you have to do it. Okay, now to give you an idea what I want to do um, in this tutorial, I just prepared a little bit of XAML and just paste it in here. And that's how it looks like when it's not formatted. And you see, it's bringing us a grid which has two columns and a few rows, text boxes here and here, labels. And those text boxes are bound already. I just will change this here to this. So I need 
a first name, a last name property for binding those properties against my text boxes. And I need a command for this OK button, button called OK command. So that's what I want my view model to be of. So let's take a look to my view model. And I decided not to paste it in, but to just show you step by step. So I, as I told you, I, we need a first name. We need a last name. That's not that complicated. And now we need a relay command, which is just to say it again, it's coming from MVVM Lite um, and we call it OK command. So to give it a little bit more meaning, we will use the constructor and we will say that OK command is a new relay command which executes one simple thing just oh my god it's happening again <laughs> one thing simple thing which is called uh, trace something uh, an info and say okay that's it it's doing nothing more and because the okay command should not be changed from outside let uh, let us give it a private setup so that's it now when we build this and we close everything and reopen our data our info sample window, we should see that those uh, tiny little hints that this binding is not possible are gone because now the context, which is an instance of data or info view model, now has the appropriate properties, first name, last name, and okay command. So this is okay at the moment. We can test it out by simply going to our uh, view model and go to the um, constructor and let's say first name equals to John. And let's see if something happens. When we go to that data or info sample, you see here the binding happens. John uh, is, oh, that's a strange John, but you know what I mean. So take this out again. So that's it for the moment. Now, data validation comes in place here, right here. And it comes to us with an interface, as I told you, called iData error info. iData error info, like I notify property changed, is built in, baked in into the .NET framework. And if I introduce it, I have to implement it. And the implementation contains two things, an indexer and a property called error of type string. To start with this property, we don't need it for WPF binding. So for instance, we could just give it a constant value using the new C sharp link, uh, syntax saying this is still a property, but it is only a getter and it always retrieves string empty. That's it. So it's out of function, but it's still there. So the interface is implemented. Now we have to deal with this method and to tell you before we go into the details, I don't know what's if I'm the only one on the planet or if there are more like me, I hate this implementation of indexes because as you will see in a second, you end up just messing around with strings and, you know, doing a little of switch case or if else stuff and the internet is full of samples just using this kind of implementation. I don't like it personally. I still don't know why Microsoft is not coming with something, you know, sophist more sophisticated in this area. But anyway, I will try to show you a solution in this scenario, which just um, enables you to implement this interface, not doing so much left hand, right hand side code like it is. So this is for, in my opinion, this is something somebody should ca take care about. Okay, so let's see what we want to do. This indexer gets called by WPF every time um, WPF needs to check if a valid, uh, if a, a value for a property, which is called column name, let's call it to property name. So if somebody, let's say, changes first name, so that means calls the setter and gives the setter a new value. This will lead um, to the point that 
this indexer is called. And so let's try it out by tracing out what's happening here. Property name and just return string empty. So it's implemented and we just want to understand what's going on. Okay, now we just hit okay. And now we see if we switch on the output, just a second, I bring the view again. Then I hit a key, the indexer comes into place and says, hey, at least the indexer is called with first name and now it's called with last name. So that's the magic. How does this work? It's not coming automatically. This comes from something which you maybe have seen already uh, as I typed it or pasted it in. Um, here you can see we defined a binding on first name and we told this binding to, first of all, told it to be a two-way binding, which means this text box gets values from the view model and pushes changed values back to the view model. This is two-way. So then the update source trigger tells this binding when to update the view model. There are a lot of properties which I can assign. It's default, it's explicit, it's lost focus, and it's property changed. Basically, this defines the events which will happen to be the triggers for updating this uh, target, which is in our case the view model. I think the default value, I don't know it exactly, is lost focus which for old Windows Forms developers is equivalent to um, value changed. Um, but we want to property changed, which means on every key type, on every situation when the property text changes in the view, the view will inform the view model. This m might not be the thing you want to achieve because in some cases that's not a good idea when you, for instance, uh, you implement a lot of database checking logic in inside of your data validation, you might not use property change because you don't want to do this on every key which is typed in. Maybe you will switch back to lost focus. Might be a better idea. And now this one, this little attribute brings data error info into play. So let's try it out. Just move it away validates on errors is off for first name and on for last name. So let's see what happens now. So first of all, let's change last name again. As you can see, it's working. And now change fir first name and nothing happens. So as you can see, this attribute just brings I data error info, which is this one. So by the way, let me do a vertical group. So now we can we can leave switching on um, back and forth. So this property in the view validates on on data error infos tells the WPF engine to look for this interface and if it finds it to call this indexer and, and retrieve an error or not if um, this value changes. So. Now we see wh when this gets called. It's called by the view on every property change. Okay, now what we have to do here. So in the simplest case, let's say if property name equals, um, I have to say I do it the dirty way first and then we get better and better. So this is one possibility. Another one will be switch property name. So let's say case first name. Let's say case last name. So as you can see, when we go on with this in in big models, this wouldn't get lead to very nice code. So the first better approach would be to use new C sharp syntax elements like name of name of first name and name of last name, get rid of those strings 
because when we incidentally change this one to last name, we get a compile time error, which is better than leaving it in a string. So now in what we what we uh, what WPF expects us to return here is the question and the, the answer is simply it, it expects us to return an error message and if we return something which is not an empty string or null it this view will interpret this error message as the error so if it has a string with at least one uh, car inside of it this means for him for 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 this model a uh, view Oh, hey, there's an error. So what we do here is if, for example, first name, if not, no, let's say if string is null or empty, first name, return, first name is required. This, that's an error message. And if no error happened, we could say return string empty, which means no error. So we could do the same thing here and say last name is required too. So last name is required. So what happens now? Let's execute this. So first of all, we without doing anything we get red borders that's because there's a default error uh, style for each control in this case text box which is saying hey if data error info on validation retrieves an error just make it a red border bordered control this is the default template error template for text box that's why wpf displays this so if we type any character this template sees because there's a data trigger hey just a second no error is retrieved for this property anymore so i uh, just take off the red border and hit again and the red border appears again so that's not very good visible because i styled nothing here and that's why i will just a second i will bring up some resources into view into this view to style it a little bit so I just explain it now so what I did here I pasted it in and now as you can see it's a little bit nicer here and I changed a lot of stuff and I will just explain you what I did so first of all let's talk about a template this control template says hey I am um, assignable to a bunch of controls because I'm not fixed on any control type I just have a key and now it's uh, saying nothing more that hey let's define a doc panel around a complete uh, control um, no matter how big it is and then on this control just draw a border uh, um, on the sides of the doc panel and just make the border orange or make the border blue and as you can see there on the top there there are some some controls are taking this template you will see that later on border thickness we can say hey let's make it six or something more useless so that's it and then place the donor element inside of it so that's the template the template is used here so what's this this is a style resource for all text boxes on this grid inside of this grid so first of all we are saying hey uh, dear style, dear text box, take a margin around you of four. So that's where the space comes from now. It's better readable. And then we are saying, hey, replace your validation.error template and use the one I uh, provided on the static resource with the name error template, which is this one. So this line in this line, oh, sorry, this line injects this template into this value that's all it does if you don't know what what i'm talking about this means you you don't fully understand wpf so you have to read a little bit about customization styling templates stuff like that okay and on the last step for text boxes we are implementing something called style triggers 
and we have one trigger which is saying hey if the validation dot has error property has a value of um, has a value of true which means it changed the value to true then uh, take a setter on the property tooltip and bind the tooltip against the text which is coming from this element don't bother this one i explained it later and as you can see there's a possibility to, to tell the text box <coughs> to get this information you just have to remember this magic stuff so where is it the tooltip comes from <coughs> this this um this element the text box itself and the text box got a property called validation dot errors and this one is an um, observable collection and we get the current item of it and from this item we just get the error content when you look at examples on the internet you will find something like this uh, i think this no, this what was it i don't know i think zero instead of current item so this is seems to work better because no hint is given this so but if you will execute this one i just leave it this way you will see in the output later on we just get errors and current item is a better way for binding it but it's it was not available on former versions so that's what this does and finally we just stay the uh, styles label to uh, get the same margins like the text boxes so they are placed nicely okay that were the styles were for now we just check this and we just hover over the element and now you can see like the style trigger just scroll a little bit this one like the style trigger binds the tool to property to a value which comes from our idata or info implementation so basically that's all you need to understand just a second i want to show you the error i hope i i see uh, an error here it is see this as soon as the property loses an error because I entered a valid value just take a look I just enter something and boom there's an error and it's saying something like item array cannot get item blah blah from validation errors blah 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 basically saying zero this one is an invalid index when you use current item instead of zero which which the editor thinks it's not possible to use but ignore this you can see it's still working and now no exception happens but it works so that's why current item is a good idea okay hopefully this helps a little bit but anyway i just want to concentrate back on the code because <clears throat> now this window this form is essentially ready it's not completely ready because i have one more thing to do i want to disable um, this ok command when any error is present so this comes in a few minutes now this part of code is just getting on my nerves first of all it's getting on my nerves because you know it's just checking one property at a time and that's not a good idea because just think about it it might be a good idea to just collect all the errors which are in the form in one place so i wa still want this behavior but i want to have as a class developer i want to have some sort of collection of errors where i can uh, where i can see in code if there are any errors because this is not good very good callable from our from my code so what i can do is now I just create something just have an idea and let's say i introduce a member variable and i call it errors no it's a property in my case you see and i make it a dictionary of two strings so what i want to do now is this dictionary should take the property name as a key and an error string as a value 
And now what I can do is in the first step, <coughs> I could say, hey, you know what? Get rid of this and just let's in implement a simple uh, method, collect errors. So, and then just return um, when the errors contains a key with name property name, then contain this value. So errors property name. In any other case, return string empty. So now we just have to implement collect errors. Just do this. And basically in the first step, we do the same stuff as we did before. So I just ignore property name and I just say if string is null or empty, first name. So first of all, I clear all the errors. So now if the first name is string null or empty, errors at name of first name to again not deal with strings. And now first name um, must be defined, something like that. And the same with last name in one step. Now, this method gets called every time one of the property changes, but checks all properties in one step. So this is not that um, it is in performance tuning. It's the opposite of performance tuning because we are checking everything now. But you still could program it in another way to implement this other changes. But I just wanted to collect all errors in one place, which is the errors dictionary. And now I just use the errors dictionary in this uh, stuff. And let's try it out if it still works. And first name must be defined, last name must be defined. And as you can see, this works. So what I can do now is the following. I can implement two properties. Let's say there is a bool property saying has errors just for convenient stuff. And let's say this one simply retrieves if errors has any items. So this is a, this one. And I'll say there's another one which is called is okay. And this should be so op the opposite of has errors. I do this because we are, um, we, we didn't have um, one subject in this uh, tutorial series, which is converters. Normally you would do this with converters, but now I do this just to implement something which I can use in the OK command, for example. And I could do the OK command is only accessible if is OK returns true. I could do not has errors, but it's not it's speaking code. So we did we didn't uh, touch commands until this moment. A command logically contains out of two elements. Just play it this way. Just a second. So a command, in this case a relay command, but it's the same in other commands too, saying, hey, the first part is something which uh, gives me the logic uh, that I should ex execute, I the command should execute when I am executed. So I'm just saying when this button is clicked, this command is behind this and this command will execute the code inside this anonymous method. So tracing something out. The second part, the second um, argument of this relay command constructor is simply saying, hey, do you want to give me a condition when this command should be executable or not? So the second part, if you define it, it's um, optional, has to return true or false. Our is okay, just returns true or false. Now, when I uh, just rebuild this one, 
you can see in the designer that is the, the OK button, even as the designer, without touching the UI even, is just not clickable now. Now what happens when I execute this? I just enter here and enter here and nothing happens. So this is not what I want it to be. So obviously uh, our view model knows that there's no um, arrows left, but this button does not um, switch to the enabled state. So what's happening? The point is the OK command um, is not able to um, uh, do the same binding like text boxes. This two-way nice binding, which means I have to manually call this command that it potentially changed its state. It should ch check against its state. So how this works is simply on this way. I'm telling the OK command, race can execute changed. And what this does basically is rechecking on the view and everywhere if the, this second part evaluates to true or false now. Let's check it again. So now, this is exactly what we want it to, it to be. Please remember that this all, this complete stuff of binding and automatic, just relies not on iData error info, but this relies on iNotify property changed, which is implemented by view model base. There is the magic coming from. And in our case, just keep in mind that there's another magic coming with a NuGet package called Fodi, which does all the wiring logic so that this setter and this setter, they are calling um, the events of iNotify property changed and they are raising those events. And that's why all this is happening so easy. So this is easy for you too, but you have to know what to switch on and what to use. If you don't know, just watch the second part of the tutorial. Okay, so now, as you can see, this is much more convenient, but it's still not the point where I wanted to get to because there is um, a part of the Microsoft stack which deals with, in my opinion, with um, um, validation, data validation, very nice. And that is the ASP.NET stack. The ASP.NET stack uses something which comes from a certain namespace. Just let me show it to you in the object browser. So there's a namespace called System Component Model Data Annotations. And I like it. <clears throat> so this namespace, which is part of the .NET Framework, has a bunch of uh, attributes. If you don't know what attributes are, attributes are the stuff which you can apply above of elements, of classes, of methods, of properties, of anything. And here you can see there are a bunch of them. And one of them is an attribute called required attribute. So what can I do with the re required attribute? I'll show you. When I just assign the required attribute and I just can omit the word attribute. I just type required. And now he's saying, hey, do you mean this required? Yeah, I mean it. And then I can say, hey, uh, it has a lot of um, optional uh, properties. And I want to say, hey, allow empty strings? No. It's saying basically required on a string means that even a null uh, value, uh, it's clear that null is uh, means a, it is not it is required but not given but if you give him a string which contains n n no character it's also considered as not given but required that's what this setting does and now the good point is <clears throat> I can do two things first of all I can give him a, f a, st a static um, error message saying first name yeah thank you <clears throat> oh my god. Maybe I should close this window because I have already three windows open on my Core i7. That's too much. First name <clears throat> must be defined. So 
that would be something oh i have to say error message that is a way to tell the required message hey if this is required but not given then this is a match message which you should uh, post back first step the other possibility is in this case to say hey i want to define a resource key so a resource file a resx file where the concrete message lays in but this makes no no sense because and now comes the bad news wpf is completely ignoring all this stuff from data annotations i don't know why because it just clearly makes sense but it it's the case it's, it's a fact so um, i'm showing you this because i decided to show you a way using reflection to just use this in your own projects so i leave required on and i'm just using required on both on first name and last name um oh by the way here was last name okay and now all we have to change is this collect errors method <clears throat> this is not what i want to use because you know this is a manual way i want to do it the automatic way so first of all what uh, is what we need is a little bit of re reflection so i prepared a little bit of code and just do it step by step one properties equals two so i import this and i explain what you what i do i'm doing reflection here and i say hey get me the type of this class which will return the type of information of data error info view model basically it returns you everything the um, object browser will see from this type too so we get all properties but we we say just give up those properties which are public and which are not static so this is what this line does then on the next line we have filter them down and saying hey just check each of those properties which were retrieved by this filter and check if they have the required attribute or if they have the max length attribute i will come to this attribute later on so and then whatever you find in this filter ju oh, sorry just make a list out of it okay so now properties is a list of um property info that's the type which are, is coming from get property so because we have a list which is an i enumerable we can do a lot of stuff now and the simple stuff which you can do is just to for each it and i have something for you so properties dot here it is just format it a little bit so what i'm am i doing here so i take all the properties which are coming out of this query and for each of them i'm doing this one and i say okay the current value of each of the properties is property info get value of this instance so this gives me the content of the property in this case the content of first name or last name then he says hey just try to get the custom attribute re required or and the custom attribute max length remember because of this filter because this is an or uh, each of the properties coming in can ha have both of this at, uh, those attributes or just one of them that's why we need to check each of them to now and if a required attribute is given we can take this attribute to do our validation like we did it before but in an automatic manner so you see he's just adding the errors like he did before now let's try if this works if we execute this still errors still working and the binding of the command is working too now that's cool so just wait a second and see what we got we got a bunch of new code and one might say hey that was not a good deal because i have i don't know 20 lines more for the same result but wait just a little second first of all because we implemented this we now can take part of the max length attribute which is another attribute from data annotations so we can say the first name is only allowed to have max length uh, you see it here i'm giving him the length of 20 or let's say 10 cars 
and the error message is a maximum of 10 characters is allowed. So let's say only first name is limited whatsoever. Now what happens automatically because of our code? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And now watch the tenth car. And now eleven is invalid too. And we have a maximum of ten characters allowed. So let's see what other things are uh, applied here. Let's uh, just, I don't know, I, ju I didn't plan it. Let's say we want to use. Um, a phone number attribute is this phone attribute specified the data field i don't know the min length okay let's say we would say something has to do has to provide a min length so when we want to support this we have to implement here another or and say min length is interesting too and then we have to create and say hey we are interested in min length attribute too. And last but not least, we have to get a new if, oh, let's say an else if. Oh no, it's an if, sadly, but it is. Because it could have all of them. When min length is there, then we have to say if the current value of this element is string empty, um, uh, no, uh, clear to string empty if the length is smaller than min length, less than min length. Then bring the min length error message to the dictionary. So use null propagation. Yeah, we could do that, but it's not um, that important now. Now. I can say, hey, let's say the last name should have a minimum of four characters, um, a minimum of four characters uh, um, must be defined. Oh, this is the error message. I forget it all the time. And additionally, it has, oh my goodness, it has a max length. We just copy it from here, from 10 or 20 and 20. Now, from this point on, we are already enabled to, to use free attributes. Oh, man, what's going on? Prop name, error message. So what is the current value? It's now. Ah. That's because, yeah, <laughs> kind of strange, but that's because we said required and just take required away. And now it will work. So let's see. Because required and min length are very, very, um, you know, uh, likely. Like, because if it has a required attribute, it says, hey, it, at least one car is required so and this one says no 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 at least four cars are required so they are both hitting so um, i should just do a little bit more sophisticated adding here but i just you get the idea behind this that because that means when i have another property like let's say a middle name coming into this one i just can say hey middle name has only uh, a max length of five, a maximum of five, and just take the min length of A. And now I'm able to, with this automatic, I, I'm able to just write my code as I'm used to, use this sophisticated attributes from data annotations, <coughs> even use um, the logic to get it from resources and to do, you know, nice attribute based programming. So now I have a middle name. I'm not using middle name. That's stupid. So just uh, add it on the view. Okay, let's see. We have another grid column coming into place. 
Do I have it? One, two. Oh, I have one more room. So let, let's just move it a little bit deeper. That's middle name. And this one should... Why is it so ugly? Thank you. This one should go to row two. Because, just a second, no, middle name stays in row one. This one goes to row two. And this one goes to row three, which is okay. Zero, one, two, three, I don't know what's happening here. And now I'm driving middle name and binding middle name. That's all. So now it should work like expected. Yeah, it's right. Middle name is not required. Boom, boom, boom. But if I give more than the allowed five characters, it's erroneous and I can't hit OK. If I take it away, I can hit OK. And just to prove it, it's writing OK to the trace like the command defined it. So <clears throat> that's almost all. What I just wanted to show you is another little tiny uh, you know, tuning on this collect errors method, which consists on the following. First of all, I'm creating a static list of property infos. Static means it's on the type, not on the instance. And now I just create a protected uh, property, which is not static, which is going to the static property infos and checking if it's now. And if it's not now, it's simply doing what we did here. So we can leave it right now. And now we just can use this property infos property to cycle. Because it's like lazy loading implemented, we can go here and it's going to this place and just collecting whatever we want to collect. So to, to see what this, um, spares us we can say at this place we are collecting type informations so just do this now watch what happens in the output window when i click one car nothing Oh, there, there it was. It's already ran, ran yeah, logically collecting type information, but it's never happening again. And because I'm storing the uh, property infos in a static variable, this won't happen during the complete runtime of this program again, because they are already stored for this type, for data array info view model. So this is the last type of, um, you know, uh, uh, tuning. I just mangled all this up in our main view model, as I told you at the beginning. So just take a look at the main view model. As you can see here, we have our first name, last name, stuff like that. And I just bound it to something, let's go there, to something which is person model dot first name. So let's take a view at main view model. There you have a person model of type person. Let's go there, F12 it. And here you can see the exact same code, a little bit commented, a little bit nicely formatted, but it's doing all the stuff which I showed you in our data error info sample, which will not be available in the block, uh, in the uh, source code. But all the stuff I showed you today will be visible here. Just to sum it up, it's very easy uh, to use data error info, but it's very easy to misuse it, in my opinion, because data error info is something which is completely dirty implemented. It's not that nice implemented uh, like uh, other kinds of um, uh, technologies. It's uh, depending on property name. And I, for my opinion, it's better to avoid string handling and something like that. So use name of operator or use reflection even as I showed you here in the property infos, you collect the collections once, uh, the informations once, and then you use the collect errors method to just get a, a local list of all errors all the time, which are hold in this dictionary, 
the key, as you remember, is a property name. The value is the error. And now you have the ability to switch the OK command, for, for instance, of this complete form on and off, enabled and disabled here, when there's any error on the form and not just one. And that's, in my opinion, a very elegant way. So hopefully this helps you. Just go to the, visit the source code and see you next time.